So in this video, I'm going to go through how to implement a 2D trajectory path or a projectile path or projectile motion path, whatever you want to call it. I will show you how to make that in your game. This is the kind of thing that you'll see if you're playing a, a shooter game and you're going to throw a grenade and it shows you the path that the grenade is going to fly to or where the grenade is, is going to land. And this is something I've already implemented. So let me show you that now. So this is the game and here is the Yeti sneaking about and running and if I press the throw button you'll see that there are some faint red dots that show me where the snowball is going to land and how it's going to fly. If I press the throw button again the snowball will follow that path and disappear and I'm going to show you how to create this path and of course once you've figured out how to create this path you can make it smooth so it won't have dots it'll just be a smooth line but it's up to you. Before I continue, I just want to give you a heads up and say this video contains a lot of physics, a lot of maths, and if you just want to find out the solution without the explanation, then feel free to skip to the end where I show you the code and how to get access to it. But if you want to hear more about the explanation and the formulas behind it, then stay tuned. Okay, so let's talk about the trajectory or projectile motion formula. So when I was doing research for this, I was directed to this page, which shows you how to make this projectile path in Unity 3D, which is fine. And before I continue, I want to say this explanation is not specific to Hacks and Hacks Pixel. Even though that's the engine I'm going to focus on, this technique can be applied to other engines or programming languages because it's just code. But anyway, this is the site that I was directed to and it was okay, but it wasn't really useful. It wasn't that helpful. So I did my own research and came across this formula, which again, looks incredibly complicated and I couldn't figure out how to replicate this in hacks code. So I went to YouTube and found this great video. I'll put a link to this in the description. This video is for the Unity game engine, but the formulas he used and the way he explained it in this video was so helpful to me that I was able to apply the same logic into a hacks flixel game. What I'm going to do first is show you the explanation of the formulas in plain English and then I'll show you the code. So here is one of the formulas I used to calculate trajectory and I'm going to go through the variables one by one. The result of this function that I, I write produces an x and y value. This is also complicated but it's a lot more easier to read than the two formulas I showed you before. So first, what is the starting point? Well, it's actually fairly simple. The starting point is the point at which you want the projectile motion to start. So in this case, that'll be about here. So this X and Y coordinate, which I guess will be the center somewhere, will be my starting point coordinate. Next, what is gravity? Now gravity, believe it or not, for Earth is a fixed number. And this is it, 981. Why is it 981, you ask? It just is. According to this site, the gravity of the Earth is 9.1 meters per second squared, and that's because the size of the Earth and the distance from its center is 9.81 meters. Basically, physics. I'm not gonna go into it, but that's just what gravity is. Now let's talk about velocity. So velocity is the speed of something in a given direction. And in my case, I've hard coded the velocity to be 5.90 on the X axis and 500 on the y-axis and I think similar to gravity is probably 5.9 and 5 meters squared so it's nothing fancy. You can see that I've used an flx point here and this is similar to a vector 2 in other languages so keep that in mind if you see that again in the code. Finally let's talk about time. What is time? And time for projectile motion is different to the time that you see on your clock or on your watch. It's actually called time of flight and this is an explanation I found on the internet. The time of flight is the time in which the projectile is flying. Essentially the time of flight in this image would be the time that the projectile is flying in the air from here all the way to here. So how do we figure that out? How would you figure out how much time the projectile is flying for? Yep, you guessed it, more physics. And that is another function that I've written with another even more complicated formula. We already know what velocity is, so I won't go through that. We know what gravity is, and we know what the starting point is. So what is the surface? Well, like I explained before, the time of flight is the amount of time that the projectile is flying from the starting point 
to the time it hits the surface. And so the surface is basically this bit. This kind of wiggly white line here is the surface. And in the code, I've got that as a hard-coded number. This was figured out via trial and error. I didn't know this off the top of my head. I just plugged in some numbers and whatever hit the surface was the one I stuck with. Now let's go more into the code. So here is the code for the flight time and the eagle light amongst you would notice that I've changed the formula a bit because I made a mistake in the previous slide. I had a plus here where it should be a times and I've added a bracket here because it's easier to read. So this is the code. We've got velocity y squared, which is a variable I use to calculate the squared value of the velocity y. And if you've forgotten where the throw velocity comes from, it comes from here. So we're returning a float and that's the throw velocity y plus the square root of velocity squared plus two times gravity times player throw position y minus the surface divided by gravity. I hope that made sense. If you want to pause the video and take some time to look at this to try and get your head around it, feel free to go ahead and do that. But essentially, this is the function that will figure out that time of flight. The other function is to calculate the projectile points. And this calculates the, the motion curve of the projectile based on the time value. So let's go through this. The time value gets passed in as an argument. This isn't the exact float from the time of flight function that I showed you before. I'm gonna explain how they link together a bit more. But anyway, this takes in time as an argument and returns a struct or an object with an X and Y value. Now I could have returned an FLX point here. For some reason I chose not to. It's not that big of a deal either way, but let's continue. So this has two variables. The X variable is the X throw position plus the X throw velocity times time. And the Y value, which I've also got here, is the Y throw position minus the Y throw velocity times time minus gravity times the time to the power of two divided by two. Again, feel free to pause this video and take a look at this function. Now let me explain how this function works together with the time of flight function. And the glue that sticks them together is this value over here, which you might have seen in the previous slide called the number of points. So the number of points is essentially how many dots are gonna be shown when the player holds the throw button. And of course, if this number was increased to 100 or 1000, this curve would be more of a line than dots. And if it was less, then it would be dots that are more spaced apart. So this is the way both functions are linked together. We get the time of flight divided by the number of points, and then we loop over each point. So that would be 20 loops. We times the flight time of, between the points to get the time. And we put that in the calculate projectile points function, which I've realized is a very bad name, but we get that time value and add it as an argument to get the X and Y coordinates. So the way this is working is, imagine the time of flight is two seconds. So the time the snowball has left the player's hand and is flying before it hits the surface is two seconds. If we divide that by 20, you get 0.1. And so if you wanted to figure out the position of the snowball at 0.1 seconds, which will be this value, the first value we get here, then it would probably be here because that has, it hasn't moved very far. And so this iterates through it. So it starts at 0.1, then gets to 0.2 and we calculate the position of the snowball at 0.2 which would be here, 0 0.3 here, 0 0.4 here, 0 0.5. And you kind of get where we're going with this. So that is how this is working. Again, this is a lot to understand. It took me a while to get my head around. So don't feel like an idiot if you don't get it the first time. Watch this video again and again until it makes sense. I've got a bit more to show, but this video is starting to get a bit long. So what I'm gonna do is stop it here and continue the rest of the content in another video.